My Lords, I too am very grateful to uh, for, uh, Lord de Lacquer and for the opportunity to take part in, in this debate. And indeed, I also look forward to a, a number of maiden speeches, not least to uh, that of Baroness Craven, I think, is following me. My Lords, clergy suffer from stereotyping uh, at least as much as in any other profession. Saturday nearly always brings me the greeting, your busy day tomorrow, Padre. <laughs> Christmas still more elicits from, from many, just coming up to your busy period, Father. Now, whatever the truth of this may be, Christmas and indeed Easter do present some regular and essential moments for clergy. And for me, with a prison, uh, indeed two prisons in our diocese and one in our sea city, it is the regular service at Wakefield Prison. I am there every year at those great feasts like clockwork. Why visit the prison, though? Prisons play a part in the way we organise human society. Indeed, they witness to myriad failures in our living together in human society. Now, Christmas, even more than Easter, is a moment for each of us to be caught up into the wider human community. And be it simply the family, the office party, the local carol service, or in our case, the Huddersfield Corps or the Messiah, Christmas spells community and humanity. The Christian story professes God's presence among us as one of us. So Christmas is a good time to reflect on the failure of community and the nature of humanity. Now I begin there in contributing to this day, debate since it seems to me that it is the flourishing and fulfilment of our humanity, or sadly in the case of many prisoners, the lack of such flourishing and fulfilment that lies at the centre of our dilemma. The need for custodial sentences points to a failure or weakness in our humanity, both within, a, within specific individual men and women and in our society as an organic whole. And such failure or weakness points to the tragic element in human nature. No realistic penal theory ignores this tragic element within the tra tapestry of our experience. And in a seminar in this place on penal reform earlier this week, we were reminded of a poignant phrase from the writings of the Russian writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn reflected, the line of good and evil cuts through every human being. This realization, however, points us to a deeper truth about the significance of people and personhood. Put boldly, it is that people matter. And that rather unmusical Anglo-Saxon concept is a key element in any theory of justice. Many years ago, I remember reading an essay titled simply, Why Mattering Matters. If anything matters at all, people matter. And retributive justice is an unpopular concept for some liberal penal theorists. But if nothing else, retributive justice contributes to that positive sense of taking every individual and community of people seriously. People are punished because we take them and their culpability seriously. People matter. Mattering, however, requires of us more than crude retributive theories of justice might seem to suggest. Mattering requires of us more than simple vengeance or similar human reactions and responses. And mattering requires of us more than simply balancing evil. Instead, it says something much richer about our personhood. And this seems to me to speak directly to the reasons or purpose for custody. And from its introduction onwards, the recent Green Paper, Breaking the Cycle, takes this issue seriously all the way through. Although protecting the public and preventing crime remain at the centre, the Green Paper, in the Green Paper, rehabilitation, transparency and accountability are listed as key principles. So this suggests a radical shift, as has already been hinted by other speakers so far in Noble Lords, in attitudes and policy, which is to be welcomed. Of course, it would be both unfair and inaccurate to suggest that there has been no restorative work within prisons. Indeed, over the past years, various attempts have been made to enrich and develop such work. And much of the effort in this direction has been blunted, sadly, by the lack of finance and resources. And we all doubtless give thanks for the educational and developmental work with prisoners that has already been achieved. Nevertheless, the fact is that despite all this good work, imprisonment not only protects 
and punishes, in the end, the use of custodial sentences cannot but diminish the person as well. In diminishing the individual, it diminishes society. It does so in two ways. First, by extracting the individual from the community, and secondly, in diminishing the individual, it reduces that person's potential contribution to our wider culture. And this uh, diminishment impoverishes us all and most dangerously reduces the person and thus ultimately the wider community's self-esteem. And I hardly need tell any of you that the collapse of self-esteem, either individually or in community, is one of the most serious corrosives of our broader humanity. Now, none of this denies the continual need for custodial sentences. The public needs protection, and if people matter, then offenders should be punished. But issues of mattering and diminishment direct us immediately to the questions of spent and unspent convictions, which lie at the heart of some of the noble Lord, Lord de Lackey's concerns. Issues about disclosure of spent convictions are key here. An appropriate handling of disclosure or non-disclosure can mean a move toward renewed self-esteem and a growing potential for a person's flourishing and fulfilment, thus moving towards a proper esteemed humanity. This means an unlocking of an individual's potential, and this has significant effects upon the community. So my plea would be for a realism about the tragic element within huma our humanity, clearly demonstrated in the propensity of all of us being unable to live by the light given to us. Therefore, it should be a proportionate and directed realism. And this points ineluctably in the direction of a proper appropriation of a clear policy on rehabilitation. The Green Paper indicates how much wider society can benefit from such a shift. But it also takes on a proper care for the individual offender. I cannot overemphasize the need uh, for urgency for action here, however. After all, the earlier paper, Breaking the Circle, was published as long ago as, as 2002. And it's a matter of some shame to us all that financial considerations may have meant that this has received low priority. In a well-rehearsed fragment of John Donne's 17th century meditation, we shall all remember the sentences, if a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me, because I am involved in mankind. Imprisonment is a kind of death. If people really matter, then prison will remain tragically necessary. It is there to protect and punish. But after death, there must be the possibility and reality of resurrection. I use the terms figuratively, of course. I wholeheartedly support the noble Lord's aims. We must counter diminishment with the opportunity to nurture a full, esteemed humanity, spent in diminishment, but rich in future aspiration. My lords, as I rise to make my maiden speech, I am incredibly conscious of the honour and privilege of joining this House. But, uh, I, I want particularly to thank the, the Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of Wakefield, for his words of welcome just a moment ago. I have to admit that then he went on to say, um, the clergy are also subject to stereotyping, and for a panicky moment, I thought we were about to get an embarrassing declaration. But, uh, but he went on to give a very powerful moral argument. And it is that quality of debate for which this House has its reputation that makes me particularly conscious of the privilege of serving here.